presentation is entitled Utah Exploratory Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. This work has been led by Dr. Norman Foster, professor in the Department of Neurology, and Dr. Mark Supiano, professor in the Division of Geriatric Medicine in the Department of Internal Medicine. The Neuroscience Initiative Path to Program Project grant funding has supported the proposal, which was aimed at establishing pilot work that would lead to an Alzheimer's disease research center here at the University of Utah. So we all know that during this year, much of the uh, plans that were made were interrupted due to the pandemic. However, we're very pleased now to hear about the progress that has been made thus far. Um, Dr. Foster, please go ahead. Thank you, Debbie. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we've been able to do in the uh, 18 months or so since uh, we received generous funding from the Neuroscience Initiative. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is the biggest challenge facing medicine in the 21st century. So, and it's not going to be going away like COVID 19. So it's very appropriate that the institution uh, devote some resources to trying to develop uh, the infrastructure to participate in uh, exciting Alzheimer's research. I'm not going to be able to review some of the exciting things on the national and international front that have developed in Alzheimer's disease over the past year, just, just to say that uh, there have been some major advances. So I'm uh, very optimistic about how things are uh, going with uh, Alzheimer's uh, research. Let's see if I can, there we go. So just to uh, tell you a little bit about the application, uh, this is a neuroscience initiative path to program project grant uh, that we received and it's for an exploratory Alzheimer's disease research center. And I'm listing here the major investigators, uh, myself and Mark, but also Ken Smith in family and community consumer studies, Lisa Cannon Albright in human genetics, Satoshi Minashima in radiology, and Kevin Duff in neurology. So we really have a multidisciplinary, multi, um, uh, departmental leadership. Our vision is that we wanted to enhance clinical Alzheimer's research collaborations at the University of Utah, leading to NIH Center funding. And we developed a unifying research theme, which is the mechanisms and predictors of individual resilience in Alzheimer's disease. So we uh, wanted to take advantage of our experience and expertise in both genetics and in brain imaging. And one of the things that we've learned from uh, brain imaging is that there is a great deal of uh, phenotypic and uh, imaging heterogeneity in Alzheimer's disease. And that's very poorly understood. There have been some significant advances in the past year about this, but still uh, we don't know what these uh, factors are that lead to differences in individual phenotype. There's also uh, considerable evidence uh, of uh, variability in rates of progression. And so we were hoping to use both imaging uh, and other measures to determine some of them clinical, some of them potentially genetic, uh, to see if we could identify what these predictors of individual differences in clinical presentation and uh, degrees of resilience. We believe that some of this heterogeneity actually reflected a difference in uh, the, the recipient, disease recipient's response or the patient's response uh, to disease, which neuropathologically is quite uniform, uh, of course, consisting of uh, neurofibrillary tangles, neuritic amyloid plaques, and loss of synapses and eventually neurons in the brain in a selective pattern. So our plan for uh, the, uh, in the proposal 
was to develop a clinical core, a data discovery and biomarkers core that would support three projects. Uh, project one uh, was, was uh, to focus on uh, what the predictors were of focal Alzheimer's disease as opposed to typical uh, by uh, by hemispheric disease um, and to see if that affected rate of progression. The second project uh, had to do with uh, see if we, seeing if we could use a family health history, a genetic history to uh, look at genetic factors that could predict uh, rates of progression and finally um, practice effects as a predictor. That is a uh, short-term uh, repeated measures practice effects. And you can see this is tightly interconnected uh, and different kinds of data would be shared between the projects developed by the cores. And uh, this included a lot of the standard collection that are required of NIH funded Alzheimer's disease research centers. Uh, in addition to the clinical core and data discovery and biomarker score, which includes imaging, uh, we also had a project administration whose goals were to provide consultation to uh, investigators throughout the university about Alzheimer's disease mechanisms and to provide mentorship for those who were drawn into the field, either established or new investigators. So I want to report first about uh, study consultation and mentorship that we've been able to provide. Uh, we have had several related uh, grants funded using uh, the mentorship of our center, one in the uh, to Richard Gergel and uh, the Department of Surgery, Karen Schleep and the Department of Family and Preventative Medicine, uh, and then one with John Price. Uh, in the, at Brigham Young University, which I'm a co-investigator in. Uh, you'll notice his uh, project uh, has to do with regional specificity of metabolic changes, which uh, relates very much to our uh, FDG PET research, uh, along with uh, Satoshi Minashima. Uh, we also have several K awards, uh, a couple of K awards that are currently under review. Uh, that have been submitted and there is a uh, R01 uh, from the Department of Psychiatry uh, that's under review. Uh, we have uh, Lisa Cannon Albright, one of our investigators is, uh, uh, is a co-investigator in an R01 re regarding uh, genome sequencing with the Cache County cohort, which is uh, a group developed by Utah State University. So we have multi-university connections as well. Um, let's see, there's an NIA. Uh, let's see, I think, um, yeah, there's uh, two other NIA uh, applications that are under review, uh, Kevin Duff and uh, involving Kevin Duff and Ken Smith. And uh, we just recently heard that uh, we have two um, awards. These are supplemental funding for Alzheimer's disease. So these are existing studies. And we've just heard that both of these fortunately have been funded. One through the Nursing Institute uh, regarding behavioral sleep, sleep changes and Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. And the others looking at uh, image analysis, <coughs> analysis uh, through the um, Imaging and uh, by um, let's see what NIBIB Institute of uh, Biomechanics and Bioengineering I think something like that. So you can see that uh, we really have a lot of different departments who have been affected by our advice and mentorship uh, in the university. It's gone beyond the university and it involves a number of different uh, institutes at NIH. Second thing I wanted to review is our clinical data and uh, research participants. Uh, this is the corresponding to the clinical core. 
that we're developing. It's very important that we uh, have these resources available for people who need this. Um, we have maintained two Alzheimer-related exemption umbrellas. One uh, to examine relationship between uh, cognitive testing, clinical features, imaging abnormalities, and the other to look at uh, patient-centered outcomes, health system outcomes, and health system processes, including uh, quality assurance in uh, uh, studies so that we can publish the quality assurance studies that we're doing uh, here at the University of Utah. Uh, as you may know, with uh, exemption umbrellas, what we're talking about is being able to utilize existing data. Uh, this, I think, is a underappreciated resource that we're offering because uh, individuals who want to do individual case reports or case series can use these exemption umbrellas as long as they aren't planning to um, uh, contact uh, patients or to uh, have any other interventions. So it really gives an opportunity for residents, fellows, trainees uh, to be able to use existing data. I think I forgot to mention uh, there's a uh, summer research student through the Rural Health Initiative who's actually doing a study with under these um, exemption umbrellas. Now, in addition to the exemption umbrellas, uh, we allow data requests that don't meet these criteria on two bases. One of them is to uh, in preparation to research. So do we have data of a particular type that the investigator is interested in about a specific topic? Uh, so if somebody is interested in looking at uh, CSF biomarkers, we do not keep, uh, collect, or store CSF. So we can tell them right away, we don't have that. If they're interested in postmortem brain tissue, we do have that and so forth. So that's, that's an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, that does not, those do not use the umbrella, but we still are able to use our, uh, our database to identify that. Another is a size of a potential data set. This, again, preparatory to research. Uh, an example of this is our clinical drug trials. Uh, the trials will have criteria for people who are enrolled, certain age limitations, certain diagnoses, uh, the presence or absence of uh, certain medical conditions, uh, severity of impairment and so forth. And it's possible to use our database to really give an estimate potential sponsors about whether this is possible or not. Now our clinical cores also uh, can be used for subject recruitment. Uh, the IRB has to approve use of the database as a source of potential participants, but we have a continuing series of requests to do that. Um, an advantage of our database over using things like Epic or personal records is that we can look at multiple criteria at once. Uh, for example, in the study that I failed to list here with the Rural Health Initiative, um, we're looking at um, the location of residents and comparing rural residents versus urban residents of uh, people in the study and how that affects the time of, um, of evaluation completion, severity at time of evaluation, and also whether in that particular study whether uh, hippocampal volume measurement, to what extent that might be helpful for rural primary care providers to determine whether a patient has significant cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so I'm listing here a number of studies uh, over the, since our, our program was founded that have used um, the clinical core for recruitment of studies. Uh, so there are uh, a number of studies in which uh, recruitment is pending. These are, let's see, all. Uh, so Carol da Cara Dassel's uh, project is under review 
at NIH. We have uh, two clinical drug trials and a American College of Radiology Alzheimer's Association study of amyloid PET that uh, is getting underway too. So that's the clinical core. Now I'm going to move on to the data discovery and biomarkers core. And what it does is manages data. Uh, it uh, does imaging and also collects tissue samples. So uh, over the past year, we've been able to have a number of capability upgrades. Um, the database has been expanded now to include patients who've been evaluated uh, both in the departments of neurology and in geriatric medicine. Um, our database is now available to up to 18 remote users over the internet, which uh, it has been very important uh, now that we have the COVID restrictions. Um, previously, we only had one remote, remote um, uh, access point. Uh, this means that it's a lot more available to investigators, even if they are off-site. Obviously, there are protections with all of this, but, but uh, they can do that. And it makes it a little easier to access, perhaps, uh, for individuals such as in nursing that may not, may not be in the same um, protected space that we have in uh, the medical school. Uh, we've also been working with the Center on Aging Participant Registry, so that we now know uh, that there is a significant um, uh, overlap between the CHAD database and the Center on Aging Registry. These were designed in different ways, different purposes, and so on. So we're investigating how these two databases might better be integrated and have a more seamless approach to uh, for re researchers to have access. No, when someone who they might otherwise be contacting in the participant registry might not be available because they're involved in a clinical drug trial, for example, or uh, might have other things that we know about that might be of value, um, such as neuropsych testing, clinical evaluation, diagnosis, and so forth. Um, we have continued to provide image processing of FDG PET scans to clinicians and investigators. We've been able to document, uh, we're doing a much better job of documenting when genetic testing has been done on a clinical basis. Uh, this can be really important um, uh, if you need people with APOE genotype or if you're looking for a particular uh, genetic uh, subgroup. Um, uh, this can be helpful. I mean, it can be, it's always helpful. Uh, I want to give one example of where it didn't work out um, because we were approached by a sponsor to have an innovative new treatment for people with uh, familial, young onset familial Alzheimer's disease with a known pre uh, um, progranulin mutation, very specific. Uh, genetic strategy for treating uh, progranulin cause frontal temporal degeneration. And we were able to fairly quickly identify that we didn't have anyone that met their recruitment criteria. Uh, I, without this database, I have no idea how we would ever be able to uh, respond to a query such as that. Uh, we also have updated uh, quantitative MRI and recently have found out that there is a site license for NeuroQuant so that we're able to reprocess uh, high quality three-dimensional brain MRI scans um, using that uh, comparative data set and uh, automatic uh, processing pipeline at no cost to investigators. Uh, don't want to go too far with that. There are always caveats, but, uh, but this is certainly a big new capability. And then we have now established both amyloid and tau PET imaging uh, routinely available here in, at the University of Utah, although the, uh, we have some 
Uh, we have one amyloid agent that's uh, uh, produced here at the University of Utah, uh, which is flutamidomol, but most studies use a different amyloid agent and all of our tau agents have to be shipped in from elsewhere. But demonstrating that we're able to do this is a an uh, important new capability. Uh, we also get monthly uh, reports from the enterprise-wide uh, data warehouse on cognitive health in university primary care, geriatric medicine, neurology, and adult endocrinology clinics. Uh, this is an ongoing process. We're able to modify these kinds of searches um, based upon our umbrella um, exemption and also with the help of the staff at EDW, we have a great relationship with them. This has proven to be extremely interesting. Um, and um, it's also a potential recruitment source. Uh, we've done some preliminary studies, for example, with uh, cardiology, showing that we can identify people who have atrial fibrillation with and without uh, cognitive impairment documented recently uh, using these kinds of reports. Um, that means that they have feasibility to submit their R01 regarding atrial fibrillation cognition. Um, so we have program evaluations we've participated in as well as quality improvement. Uh, we've also done data sharing. Here's the uh, cardiology department uh, division of cardiovascular disease that, uh, that we contributed to. There's one from College of Nursing uh, we also have an application that uh, we helped prepare the data for through the CTSA, uh, Interinstitutional Pilot Project, with the other institutions uh, that, that are listed here, but with an investigator at the university who's leading the effort in population health sciences. We've also been, uh, we're in the process of contributing specimens, sharing specimens, with the National Centralized Repository for Alzheimer's Disease called NCRAD. Now, um, the, all of the funded uh, NIH funded Alzheimer's centers are required to share, to collect and share tissue specimens with NCRAD. Um, and so we were able to um, develop this. Uh, it's also optional for other projects to contribute to this. Um, investigators throughout the, uh, throughout the world are able to go through a process to get the kinds of specimens we need. Uh, working with the National Institute on Aging, we were able to be the first site to provide fixed whole brain specimens, postmortem brain specimens, to NCRAD. And uh, Nina Silverberg, head of the Alzheimer's Center program was instrumental in providing the extra funding to NCRAD to offer this new tissue source. Very, very grateful to her and to them for doing this. We're in the process of transferring 230 frozen brain tissue specimens that Dr. Pulse has been able to store for us over the past few years. Uh, and it, this means that we're going to be able to also share uh, with investigators phenotypic data on 241 cases, including uh, masked uh, autopsy reports from our neuropathologists and uh, lay case summaries. And all of this has been possible, both uh, with the help of Dr. Pulse and with AREP. So they're really great uh, collaborators to make this possible. Um, we are retaining, of course, a lot of information here. We're not sending all the information we have. There's linked data uh, that's indicated in the phenotype uh, data that we're sending. For example, we might indicate for a particular specimen, we have serial, we have five serial neuropsychological assessments that are available. And uh, the way that works is that NCRAD knows that those data are available. If the uh, investigator wants to use that as part that additional information as part of their research on these specimens, then they contact us directly and then we would have to work out how that would be accomplished, primarily through an MTA because these are all deceased 
individuals. Um, we also have uh, uh, developed a new mechanism to obtain outpatient postmortem examinations. There's now a decedent affairs coordinator and with ARUP and the Department of Pathology, outpatient postmortem exams can be obtained. Uh, the, this replaces the gift to life outpatient autopsy planning program in which 640 cases were performed. So we have autopsy confirmation in a very large number of cases that are well characterized and many of which we have specimens for. Now, what about uh, using our data resource? And so I've listed here peer reviewed publications. Uh, the people in, uh, that are highlighted here are the people who are investigators in the Alzheimer in this, in, in this application, the EADRC. And um, so we have a number of, of uh, publications from this. It's very important that we have uh, neuropsychological data in all of our, the cases that have been evaluated. And so if uh, there's one area, it's neuropsychological testing where this has been uh, utilized the most. We have a few papers also in press that use uh, these data as well. And then uh, because I want to leave plenty of time for questions or comments, uh, I want to go on now going from the core cores to the projects. And here, as uh, Debbie uh, mentioned, uh, with COVID, we've been able to make less pro progress. So I'll tell you what where we stand with those projects. So a lot of things have changed since our uh, original submission uh, back in, uh, I believe it was September of 2019. We got funding in January of 20, I may be mixing this up, 2018, 2019, I guess. We got January of, help me Debbie, uh, 2019, 2020, I can't remember. It was 2019. 2019. Yeah, so we submitted this in September 2018. So in the subsequent three years, there are a lot of things that have changed. Uh, change in faculty structure, make it difficult for many of the, our initially listed investigators to participate. Uh, both neurology and geriatrics have gone to pay to do. Uh, so they can't, investigators have to donate time uh, and they don't get salaries that include research activities that are not funded like this administrative structure has changed. Uh, the Alzheimer Center has been disbanded, uh, which makes uh, some planned staff support, uh, administrative support is less available than we expected. Uh, we did submit, as we had proposed, the P20 application a month after we submitted this application and before it was funded. Um, unfortunately, it was not funded. Uh, we have been in touch with NIA who tells us that they are unlikely to have uh, any additional P20 application opportunities. There will be P30 application opportunities in a few more years. So depending upon what happens in subsequent years, that might be possible. Uh, it's, um, it was particularly, um, I don't know, poignant, I guess is the way to say it is that there are now two, um, previously there were no NIH funded Alzheimer centers in the Intermountain West, depending upon how you want to categorize Intermountain West. Now there are two, one in Las Vegas and one at the University of New Mexico that were funded uh, as opposed to our application. In addition, uh, there's been an inst institutional hiring freeze um, just about the time we were needing staff support and uh, trying to get support. We're hoping that that will uh, end in the next month or so, so that we'll be able to move forward. Um, so this also, of course, caused uh, restrictions on recruitment and on the use of optional research procedures, such as imaging procedures. Our clinical trials were able to proceed because there was potential benefit, but these are what we had proposed here was, was really observational and uh, we could not argue that there was benefit that made them urgent to continue 
Um, on May 24th, as most of you are probably aware, uh, the research operation level has moved from orange to yellow. So it may be possible to do some of the recruitment that, that uh, we envision for this, for this effort. And uh, perhaps one of, the, uh, one of the biggest problems is that we were proposing to use a pool of already partially characterized participants. Um, and so uh, this would have made the funding level consistent with doing a lot of brain imaging and genetic testing and other kinds of things. Brain, uh, so I'm talking both about uh, FDG, amyloid PET, uh, quantitative MR, all of those were going to be before and after. We, that was our you know, uh, baseline and one year follow-up was uh, our trial design. And unfortunately, in the time that we've lost since uh, now 2017 to 2021, uh, really, uh, we've this pool um, essentially doesn't exist, or very little of it uh, still exists. Um, even uh, one of the major studies that we support, the NIH-funded study by Dr. Duff. Uh, did quantitative MR, did amyloid PET. We were proposing just to add FDG PET and genetic testing to that group, but his project also was shut down for COVID. So there's been a long gap since um, people were recruited for his study that might be qualified for this. So our original strategy was this, to have an external review of our Alzheimer program, which was accomplished in May of 2019. We had two NIH Alzheimer's Center directors, Ron Peterson and Sanjaya Asina, who came on site. We presented, um, they presented to others. This was sponsored by Neurology, Internal Medicine, Psychiatry, and Radiology. Um, knowing what their recommendations were for developing a NIH-funded Alzheimer's Center, we submitted the NSI um, in September of 2019 and then a P20 exploratory ADRC, you can see it has the same name, uh, in October of 2019. The P20 provided only for cores, not for projects. And um, uh, so our current, that's what we were planning to do, um, but now what we're talking about doing uh, and we're interested in feedback and recommendations from NSI about this. Instead of applying for an Alzheimer disease research center, applying for a P30 Pepper Older Americans Independent Center, which has both cores and pilots. So the cores be, or the, the cores for our EADRC become the cores for the Pepper Center application, the projects become pilots. RFA for this P30 application is due is expected in summer of 2022. Deadline for submission we expect uh, to be about October of 2022. Uh, Mark Supiano has been on review committees, the most recent review committee for the P30 Pepper Centers that were funded. And so we have, and we've been talking to program officers there. So uh, we think we're in pretty good shape for this. Uh, we've drafted a unified unifying research theme that's related, but not the same. Mechanisms and predictors of individual cognitive resilience in age-related chronic disease multimorbidity. So we have through our EDW, a lot of uh, preliminary data about multimorbidity and cognitive health. Uh, and you'll see that the focus of our group with neuropsychology and genetics, all of this fits in. It's just that pepper centers don't do Alzheimer's research. They do do age-related or uh, cognitive impairment. So we can look at the mechanisms just as we did before. Um, well, there, it also seems to fit better with U of U resources. Uh, one of the weaknesses that we had was lack of 
a neuropathology core for the Alzheimer's Center, but Pepper Centers don't require neuropathology. So we we'll, don't have to worry about that. Doesn't require a Alzheimer clinical program, but it can support Alzheimer investigators. So that fits with what's happening now. Uh, we have a larger group of existing investigators from throughout the campus that could be involved. Since it's not just Alzheimer's disease, we can look at Center on Aging investigators and uh, pilot grants uh, that have been funded through the Center on Aging. Um, and we can also include the VA in this program. And so again, that will be helpful. So this is the way it works out. The project administration of our current NSI project becomes the leadership administrative core. You can see clinical core. Uh, so the names are slightly different. Uh, quarters are similar and uh, we'll probably just continue the plan right now if the NSI thinks that this plan is a good one and fits with their expectations uh, for their funding, then we will reorganize um, and really focus on getting the P30 using this uh, preparation for a P30 uh, application. So those are the things I wanted to cover and uh, love to hear questions, comments from all of you who've uh, given me this time. Norman, thank you very much for a very clear uh, presentation and actually a, a substantial accomplishment in the air, work areas despite the pandemic. It's very impressive to see all the infrastructure that has been um, designed and set up. And, it, and also thank you for the plan that you're proposing to continue uh, moving ahead towards a P30 rather than just saying we can't move ahead. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm very happy to hear that. Um, I don't wanna monopolize this. I wanna open this uh, for questions, but I do wanna say um, I would love to see affective measurements or some sort of uh, additional emotional control measurements be added to your workload, especially if psychiatry is going to be involved. I think it's a natural when you're aging that as you have reduction in executive functions and cognitive functioning that you see alterations in, in affective regulation. Um, yeah, so, Yeah, that's very helpful. Let me comment about that a little bit. Uh, so the um, Alzheimer's disease research centers funded by the NIH have to complete significant uh, or have significant data collection in fact, it's a 50 page form that has to be completed every year with every applicant. Um, and this is, you know, this goes into the National Alzheimer Coordinating Center database and so on. So one of the things that we felt we needed to do with the uh, EADRC originally was prepare to do that kind of collection. Uh, when we failed to get the P30, then we re-envisioned that to lesser degrees of just what was needed by the three projects that we proposed. Um, I think, uh, as you were stating, we need to rethink about this, about what would be appropriate for the uh, P30 Pepper application. And we definitely, we do not have enough psychiatry involvement, as you can see from the list. We would love to have more psychiatry involvement. I know Mark and I have talked about this, uh, and I think Mark has actually talked to Dr. Rappaport about how that might work. Um, but uh, even the projects that we're supporting right now, we already know. Karen Schleep, for example, using the UPDB R Chad database uh, and um, uh, and I think BRF, BFRSS data set from the state of Utah has actually found in her set that uh, pre existing depression in midlife is the biggest predictor that she found with Alzheimer's disease in the UPDB cases and the Cache County cases. So yeah. definitely it's a big, big player. We need to understand more about it. And I think. Uh, that Mark and I are very anxious to involve those growing local strengths in this effort. It makes makes sense. I, I want to point well, out if, if I could just the key. Let me, I'll, just a second. I just want to say that 
the key to this particular group of projects is the cross discipline, cross departmental, even across campus collaboration. So all of this takes a lot of effort, but the NSI support gives it credence. Yeah, Mark, go ahead. If I could just expand, thanks Debbie. And, and as Norman said, you're spot on. And uh, thankfully, uh, with Dr. Rappaport's recruitment here and the investment, as everyone knows, in the Huntsman Mental Health Institute, there are opportunities now to uh, engage psychiatry colleagues, uh, hopefully yourself included, Debbie, uh, in this overarching theme of cognitive resilience. And I think one of the, and I'm, I'll, I'll focus just on the depression aspect now, but I think in general, uh, the, the slight shift from the theme of cognitive resilience from the ADRC perspective to the Pepper Center perspective um, doesn't change really much of our scientific focus on cognitive resilience, but it opens the door to expand into these other collaborative areas, including mental health and psychiatry. Um, so this is, I think, a, a great opportunity. I've had the occasion to meet with Dr. Rappaport on uh, several occasions. I shared with him an earlier version of the slides that uh, Norman just presented to let him know about uh, the infrastructure that uh, I, I, you so rightly characterized. And I really want to uh, thank and credit Norman for uh, doing as much as he's been able to accomplish uh, and colleagues, Lisa's on the call here and others, uh, despite all of the challenges that uh, he uh, reminded us all of. So I, I, I believe that there are opportunities with um, uh, the growing interest of the Department of Psychiatry in this area. I'm actually um, included now in a, a research team of Dr. Rappaport's that's focused on a novel intervention to treat geriatric depression. And to this end, uh, my contribution will be to make sure that we're including measures of cognitive performance in this uh, multi-site trial. So moving in that direction, again, that would be a great project to wrap into the Pepper Center application, falling under the theme of cognitive resilience related to geriatric depression and its impact on cognition. So you're exactly right. Um, this is why we're so excited about the expansion in a sense mm -hmm. of this opportunity to uh, collaborate even further across campus, uh, but to continue on this thematic area of cognitive resilience. Great. Uh, I want to, um, Dr. Pulse wants to make some comments as does Satoshi, but let me answer first, our eyes and retinas preserved as well. And that has not been part of the autopsy service to my knowledge. There is, I believe at Moran, uh, some collection of eyes and retinas, but I don't have any information about that. So then Stefan, you had uh, some questions or comments. Uh, thanks, Norman. Yeah, thanks for this uh, talk. Um, a, a few comments and then two questions. Um, I did not want you to walk away from this talk with the impression that the Alzheimer's Center is disbanded. Um, actually, under Dr. Reddy's direction, it has now seen more patients in eight months than um, it did in the prior two years. So it's, it's really alive and well. And scientifically, there are also uh, several accomplishments uh, um, I don't know, it probably didn't show an NIA funding, but uh, Dr. Scholes in the Department of Neurology received supplemental funding from the NANDS to look at Alzheimer's disease and especially at the role of RNA binding proteins uh, in uh, the neurodegenerative process. And also with the NSI support, uh, we were able to recruit a new physician scientist from UCSF who will look at uh, cognitive uh, dysfunction or social cognition dysfunction in, in mouse models. Uh, so there's actually a lot going on, although I, I uh, see really the um, Alzheimer's research, at least in the Department of Neurology, really focus on molecular uh, underpinnings of, of Alzheimer's disease. Because that's, I think, where the treatments will be coming from. Um, two questions to, to Norman. You mentioned that the um, program project grant was triaged. Um, could you, uh, actually tell us a little bit about what the points of criticism were and how they can be addressed. And then the second question actually relates to the use of genealogy as opposed to genetics. And I think they are actually fundamentally different. And uh, uh, I would think the, the strength would lie in combining them both. So uh, first regarding um, 
why the P30 or P20 application did not get funded. Um, they were very concerned that there was a lack of sufficient um, uh, investigators. Uh, both Mark and I were are uh, nearing the end of our career. They did not see uh, a, a group of young, uh, younger um, investigators that were funded that uh, could carry the program forward. So I think the real weaknesses, uh, from my view, Mark may have some other comments, uh, really had to do with some of the same uh, issues that were raised by our external reviewers uh, in, uh, ahead of that. Um, there was, I do not, it's been a while since uh, we received this. I'm, uh, you know, happy to look into it and, and uh, have a discussion. I think it would be really valuable. Uh, it's something that NSI might be able to help us uh, coordinate to see how we could respond to the concerns. But uh, there were not, um, they, there were, as I recall, they, uh, they liked the, um, uh, focus of the research. Uh, we didn't have any objections that I saw to the mechanisms, stuff like that. There's no neuropathology. There are several things that we tried to finesse. Um, you know, no neuropathology core was a big issue. Um, anything else, Mark, that I should include? No, it has been some time, and I, Debbie, I believe that we shared those uh, summary statements with you and the NSI leadership uh, when they were received. Um, yeah, we, we knew that we had deficiencies going in. The goals of the exploratory ADRC were to fill in those gaps. Unfortunately, the delta between where we are and where the gaps were were viewed to, to be too substantial. Um, we can certainly revisit those uh, criticisms I think the, as Norman explained from a timing perspective, um, first though, based on what um, Nina Silverberg has shared with us, there's not likely to be another call for exploratory ADRCs. We know that if there were deficiencies identified for the exploratory ADRC level of, of competitiveness, that we would not be competitive for a full P30 ADRC uh, given those deficiencies, the neuropathology core perhaps being the most blatant of those. So they're, they're uh, and then the timing from uh, the submissions, the ADRC uh, last cycle applications were submitted last September. So it'll be another two years before the next rounds will be going in. And we um, believe that we are more likely to be successful with the NIA Pepper Center mechanism than we would be uh, trying to uh, fill in all of the gaps that would be needed to, be, to even meet the requirements to apply for an ADRC at this point. Yeah, and with regard to the second, Stefan, uh, because of limited time, I, I think that that discussion is really a very good one. I'd want to have Lisa talk about that. I, I just have to point out that uh, the genealogy in general, we viewed as the first step, obviously, what the genetic... Uh, uh, background is is um, important. I mean, the genetic mutation or variation is important, but how to explore that. And in fact, on that list of papers are uh, investigations of, um, um, uh, of resilient genes that have been identified. So part of our application included the, not just the genealogy is, is the process, but the genetics and the biomarkers we, uh, are the outcome. But I hope we'll be able to talk about that later. Satoshi, you um, also wanted to comment. Yeah, I think uh, I appreciate a uh, very nice presentation, Norman. Uh, my question actually relates to what the Stefan um, um, is, is saying. I think uh, this pragmatic change in the goal, you know, from uh, P20 ADRC to uh, uh, Pepper Center, Kind of makes sense, you know, because uh, eight, um, you know, Huntsman Mental Health Institute being established and uh, core expertise, you know, comes from Mark and uh, yourself, Norman. Uh, but um, you know, the first Pepper Center was established at the University of Michigan, and I was there. So there was, a, and the Mark was there. So um, 
you know, I, I helped I, Satoshi. I helped write it actually. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. So I was on you know, faculty there then, <laughs> so exactly. I know it well. Yeah, so I, I think the, it's even actually increased success, you know, rate of this submission to a paper center, right? But uh, Michigan also had the ADRC, and those two, you know, uh, pro programmatic, you know, centers totally, I, I think, overlaps, but clearly different goals. And uh, ADRC really used to be, you know, including some of those basic science side of the discovery and other things. And uh, one of the important recognition uh, dealing with this Alzheimer disease and other things, you know, there is a huge overlap with other types of neurodegenerative conditions such as, you know, Stefan is working on, um, you know, TDP43 and FDD and also ALS all coming into. So um, for this particular application going after Pepper Center makes sense, but it's gonna actually make a little void on the real AD, ADRC uh, type of research, which I feel we have a momentum at the University of Utah because basic science group, you know, like Jason and other people are kind of coming up. Autopsy has been the weakness, but we have a new hire in the pathology and uh, um, you know, this person actually worked at the Northwestern with uh, Meslam and other people. So, you know, deeply into uh, Alzheimer's pathology, right? So if we're going to actually make this pragmatic change to uh, Pepper Center, we still have to think about the research, you know, infrastructure for something like Stefan has been doing, you know, more uh, Alzheimer neurodegeneration, biomarker based, you know, mechanistic research side. So I, I don't know how you're going to think about this strategy moving forward, but I just wanted to make a comment about that. Well, let me respond to that a little bit. Uh, both the uh, Pepper Center and the Alzheimer's Center are clinical research programs. Yeah. And so um, it is possible. There are different mechanisms in the NIA for basic science uh, center grants. Um, help me with the name of that, uh, Mark. The, the, uh, shock, the shock the shock center, center yes. the basic science oh, yeah. Yeah. that's the basic science side which which yeah. michigan also has of course but um so to your point satoshi and, and for everyone uh, uh uh here today we are uh just gearing up really to start the planning process for a pepper center we were looking to get this this input from everyone uh, my goal is that over the summer we'll be meeting with uh, you and other leaders to help establish the leadership for the course. And uh, to Norman's point that he and I are uh, entering the um, most productive terminal components of our careers, I would say, <laughs> uh, that um, we need to identify core leaders uh, outside of myself and, and uh, other senior folks to be uh, identified as leadership for the course. And then to your point, Satoshi, and to Stefan as well, the Pepper Center is, is, exists to support projects. So if there are projects across the translational spectrum that fit into the overarching theme for the Pepper Center, that's perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So we do wanna to continue to support those mechanistic studies across the translational spectrum uh, with the cores that the Pepper Center will fund. Mm -hmm. So I think there's good synergy there. And this is exactly the discussion that we wanna uh, be engaged in over the next nine to 12 months before we get down to brass tacks about actually writing the proposal. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I wanted to mention, Satoshi, is that I was actually on a task force of the NIA to, under, to get the Pepper Centers and the Alzheimer Centers to work together. You're right, when we were at Michigan, there was actually a, a, a sharp line Pepper centers could not do Alzheimer's research or anything that looked like Alzheimer's research. Uh, and um, that has broken down. As I mentioned, we've been, Mark has been in touch and confirmed this with current leadership. And I, uh, in my uh, role as an advisor to NIA, also helped try to promote that. It was a right. really interesting read. Uh, all the center directors were there, all the Pepper Center, Alzheimer's Center directors, Pepper Center, NIA staff, and a few of us uh, who weren't involved in either one to try to, yeah. try to get them to, to work just, together. Just to amplify that, uh, right, as Norman said, there had been a firewall, really. The Pepper Centers could not, I think if you 
had the word Alzheimer's in the grant that was rejected out of hand. Right. Uh, so that that no longer is the case. And there's a growing recognition. And I think that as the, the overarching theme that Norman presented displays, the reality is that Alzheimer's disease and dementias are the dominant comorbidity. But dementia doesn't exist or doesn't present very often anyway, at least in older adults, you know, yeah. exceptions with early onset with familial AD, et cetera. But for most uh, people that, that we're seeing uh, in, in the geriatric age range with dementia, that's not their only condition, right? It's the, maybe the dominant comorbidity, but there are multiple chronic conditions that have an impact. And that's where the Pepper Center uh, fun, you know, mechanism and structure is recognized that it doesn't make sense to be focused on older adults independence right. while ignoring that dominant comorbidity of cognitive impairment and dementia. Yeah, exactly. And I, right. I think, again, I said, you know, prag pragmatically, I think this, this change seems to really make sense. And, uh, uh, and the Mark had the first effort to write the first pepper Center grant, and uh, 30 years after he's writing the second, <laughs> so you know, yeah, uh, rate for the success may be really high or really low, but uh, at least you know, uh, having Mark and uh, is gonna. My my see, my question is only concerned about uh, in the last 30 years, there has been a huge progress in the mechanistic understanding of neural degeneration, which is not just unique to Alzheimer's disease, but crosses, right? So uh, uh, amyloid tau and alpha synuclein plus TDP43 plus, you know, other things are, you know, coming, coming into the field. And we have a bit of weakness in the neuropathology side, you know, at the University of Utah, but the molecular research is kind of growing. So my question is just uh, not, I mean, this grant, really wonderful presentation, but how are we going to capture that at the University of Utah so everybody can move forward. You, you understand? No. The ADRC P20 itself is not good enough to really support, but the in, initial idea of having, you know, Debbie Perry, Debbie actually is funding this NSI is really to support, grow Alzheimer research as well. You, you understand it's not just the center grant. So. You know, I'll just say that Steph, the project that Stefan uh, mentioned uh, was supported by the Alzheimer uh, EADRC, I don't know if it was before or after our EADRC funding, but by the cores we're talking about, wouldn't have been possible, mm -hmm. I don't think, without that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, Debbie, uh, Scott Langenecker wanted to ask a question. Do we have time or is our time up? Uh, yeah, I, no, we, we can allow for a few more minutes. Anybody who needs to leave can just leave, but let's go ahead. Let's go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I just wanted to to, to mention uh, another Michigan connection here, but that's right. Uh, apart from that, um, <laughs> hey, uh, apart from that, there are um, collaborators at the uh, Pittsburgh and at uh, UConn. Uh, we're actually writing a multi-site uh, grant. We're actually, I don't know if you want to say far enough along, because it's not far enough along until it's submitted. Um, looking at a uh, lifespan model of um, dose response in depression. So it actually comes directly to this to this question of how does depression increase uh, vulnerability for Alzheimer's, uh, and so we're actually looking at uh, collecting a three three site cohort of uh, about 580 people, um, two thirds of whom will have a history of depression, and the idea is to actually look at the dose response relationship over time. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there so people are aware that that could fold very nicely into this um, into this center uh, application. Of course, it isn't submitted, hasn't happened yet, but I, I did want to mention that. Yeah, well, thank you for doing that. And it gives me the opportunity to say that that's what the, the most uh, powerful thing that's happened because of neuroscience initiative funding is to bring people, have a reason to bring people together and to list commonalities. So finding out about, about that proposal, you know, that would might be one that would be relevant for us to recognize with this initiative. So that's, that's helpful. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for your comments and thoughts. And there's uh, a few people who have to get it off anyway. Um, what I do suggest is that we'll reach out to people to see if we want to continue this conversation with smaller groups or even a larger group, depending, uh, because I do think that we need to keep the momentum going and we need to make sure we make 
the best next steps possible. So thank you everybody for your contributions today. Okay. Thank you, bye-bye.